Today I get to talk about my favourite subject and that is gut health and the microbiome. It's a, an area of health that we're only just starting to learn lots and lots about. Of course it's very difficult for, for doctors to talk about and experts and scientists because it's something you never get to see but as we're starting to learn it is so crucial to our overall well-being and in fact you know for thousands of years we thought that virtually all illnesses started in the gut uh, in fact I think it was Hippocrates that said that all illness starts in the gut but today uh, doctors say well of course it can't be all illnesses but certainly a lot of them do in fact some say 80 or 90 percent of all illness starts in the gut now this is such a fascinating subject we thought let's go to the top of the tree Let's find somebody that's an absolute expert in this area and we have indeed done that for you today because we're joined in a moment by Hannah Richards. Hannah Richards uh, runs a gut clinic and she's going to tell us all about the microbiome, how to nurture it, how to look after it, how to protect it and how to you know, make sure it's in good working order. Uh, then later in the show we're going to the Trussell Trust, we're going to the Operations Manager of London and the South East which is the lovely Kate uh, Dangerfield and uh, Kate's going to give us an update uh, of how the food banks are getting on across the UK uh, and during the show if you can if you can, can make a donation uh, just giving would be fantastic or you can text uh, us uh, with the text number uh, that's going to come on your screen in a moment remember more than ever people need our help in the UK there are still families in the UK and even more so at the, at the moment with these financial difficulties uh, that need help putting food on the table. So any donation you can make, whether that be £5, £10, £2, it doesn't matter what it is, every penny you make is going to help people in the UK that are struggling to put food on the table for themselves and their children. Uh, also, as well as the financial donation, it's really, really important if you can Next time you're in your local supermarket, search for where the food bank boxes are, the collection points, and add in any of the items you see uh, to the right of me there. Uh, those are the sort of food types, and in particular, at the moment, UHT milk uh, is in very, very short supply. So if you can put in UHT milk, that is greatly, greatly appreciated. But we'll speak to Kate later, and she will give us a bit of an update. Now, confession times. I tell you many times that I'm dyslexic. I'm also not very good at maths. It wasn't something I was particularly good at school. And that is why uh, with our food facts, a few of you have been messaging me to say, Steve, there are missing numbers on the food facts. So what I would say is this, don't worry about the number of the food fact, as in today, I think we're at 27, 28. Just write down <laughs> the foods that we talked about. And here's a few for free. We've been talking about eggs, tomatoes yesterday, we looked at oranges and discussed whether they're good for health or not good for health. Today, we're going to discuss quickly tuna. Today's uh, fact is tuna. Tuna is a fish, of course, that you can get even off the coast of the UK. In fact, we've been getting some record-sized tunas over recent years. Tuna is jam-packed full of goodness. Um, if you do buy it in a tin, try and get one that's in water, not in oil. Now, you might go, well, normally oil would be better. The only trouble is, if you buy it in oil, when you drain that oil away, it will drain away some of the goodness, some of the omegas. Uh, whereas if you have it in water, water and oil don't mix. Therefore, when you drain the water away, you retain all the goodness in your tuna. So although that does say food fact 26, ignore the 26. <laughs> Just write down the word tuna. And the more facts you can remember, the more food types you can... That's why everybody's going back now and looking at all the clips that we've done already, the more you can write down, just the word tuna, tomatoes, everything that we've covered, then uh, we're going to have a competition at the end of lockdown and uh, we'll pick one lucky winner to uh, give a, a, a thousand pounds worth of free jewellery, uh, courtesy of Gemporia, or you can choose to come and spend a weekend with us in Warwickshire uh, in a boutique hotel and we'll go out and have a big slap up meal, but of course a healthy meal together. Right, let's get on with today's show. Uh, Hannah is dialing in. I think Hannah's uh, dialing in from her home. Hannah, great to see you. Hi, how are you? Oh, fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show. I've admired your work for a very, very long time. I've, uh, on, my, uh, on my Kindle, I've got your, uh, your first book and uh, fascinating. In fact, you're one of the pioneers that sort of 
sort of really got me to start looking at gut health and, and you know, I took lots of inspiration uh, from you in, in, in sort of the early days of writing my book. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's very uh, heartwarming to know. <laughs> so where should we dive in? Let's dive in uh, by explaining what the microbiome is before we get into why it's so important. Sure. Well, uh, the, the, mi the microbiome um, is it, sort of this environment that's made up of trillions of little tiny microbes that live in your gut. But the, the, there's a few microbiomes. I mean, the first one really is our mouth. Um, and, and so we call it the first microbiome. And that's where all our saliva is. And that's where all our enzymes are. And saliva is really, really powerful um, in not only as being a bit of a disinfectant, but also include, you know, includes all these enzymes and different components to help us break down our food. And, and then all the food we eat then makes up uh, with the different strains of bacteria, makes up the microbiome in our gut. Um, then people talk, certainly females have a vaginal microbiome as well. And that has a big role, certainly when, uh, when they give birth and the health and the immunity of, of, of the baby when it's born. So the whole body in a way is a bit of a microbiome, but essentially the microbiome in the gut is the one that everyone knows. And that um, can really dictate the health of your, um, the health of you, the health of, health of a person, whether it's a, a functioning in a healthy microbiome or it's a bit sort of stark and uh, stagnant. And before people go, ah, this is all just rubbish, it can't make that much difference, da 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 The reality is, and this is when it struck home for me, the, if you took all the bacteria in our gut and weigh, put it on scales, it weighs more than our brain. So that, that was the, the trigger for me. I went, oh, crikey, this must be important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in, in sort of physical therapy and um, with the physical body, if, you're, if your head is out of alignment, um, you know, you just have to knock it forward and feel the weight of it, right? It, it's really, really heavy. Um, and so it does. It just completely brings home that we are really what we eat. Or as I say in the book, uh, we are what we don't excrete. <laughs> like it. Like it. We are what we don't excrete. Because it is true, isn't it, that uh, poop is predominantly made up from our microbiome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, so, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a prevalent time, isn't it? That we're sort of um, having, um, uh, we're eating more and we're cooking more and therefore potentially we should be feeding our microbiomes more. So that's, that's an exciting thought. So it's important because it's large. In fact, uh, in one of the books I read, 10% uh, human, it said that our body cells, our own sort of human cells are outnumbered 10 to 1 by the amount of bacteria we've got, therefore we're only 10% human. So uh, it, it's really important then that we think about this microbiome and what could affect it in positive ways and negative ways. Um, talk through what you know, people can do to protect their microbiome. Sure. Um, so I think there's some, you know, obviously the easiest thing for me to get a flourishing microbiome so we've obviously got just to give a, a visual for people if you think about your microbiome or indeed your gut as a flower bed a, a, a bed of roses and that's the ideal situation we should be looking at we should be looking at all these beautiful different color different sized flowers then you've got a few weeds in between and that's the sort of dysbiosis that's the sort of the the pathogenic or the or the bad bacteria and we need both. We need good and we need bad to play off against each other and work well in, in a more in a commensal way. So we do need good and we do need bad. Of course, we just need way more good bacteria than than the baddies. Um, so to to increase your microbiome, we need to eat a, a completely varied diet. So there's lots of people. There'll be a lot of people out there that certainly prior to lockdown would have the same breakfast because they were rushing out of the door or indeed no breakfast and that's not a problem either. Lunch might be at Pret or Leon and dinner 
definitely might have been a deliveroo or, you know, one of three meals that the majority of people can make. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it just doesn't increase any goodness because you're getting the same food, therefore the same bacteria day after day. And what we do know is that for a real flourishing microbiome and for optimal gut health, we want to have like 60 up to 100 different foods going through the body at, at, um, in, a, in a day. And that may seem like an awful lot, but when you start counting herbs and spices and seasonings and oils and then salads and micro leaves, then you start to understand that very quickly you've got 20 different foods in your salad bowl as opposed to one iceberg lettuce. And it's just that education that people need to know to, to know that they don't need to take expensive probiotics or expensive supplements to a degree. Of course, they're brilliant, they help. But we can start by getting back to basics and that starts from cooking essentially with our own hands and that will increase the microbiome. And I guess the microbiome for the first two million years of mankind was in quite good balance because you know, there was no supermarkets, there was no fridges, so uh, man would have been foraging and, and taking lots of different plants at different times of the year, and therefore, you know, although we, you know, we, we they call animals, but again, they, would eat, they were eating bugs, they were eating insects, and then it'd be the big animal the next day, and then it would be whatever was growing, you know, the mushrooms. I guess through, you know, until the last 100 years or so, I guess our... Uh, uh, diet was much more diverse than it is today. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I completely agree. I think what's happened now, obviously, you know, the moment supermarkets came in and people realised they could profit out of different different beans, different grains. I mean, the soybeans, the most sort of um, pimped out food in the world. Um and, you know, it started, you know, when it's fermented, when we talk about fermented foods and they have a really good um, nutritional value to us. But once you start um, turning different foods into essentially processed products, then that's when we start to deplete everything within within the bodies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, it, it all sort of really comes back down to soil and how, you know, we used to cultivate the land and everyone would... Be, sort of had a better understanding of how um, the relationship between the, the soil, animals and humans worked. And now it's almost like we've just put a, a big board in, in the middle of that and gone, we refuse to take any responsibility for what we eat and therefore a responsibility of our health uh, against what we eat. And then we all seem to think that, or there's a consensus, isn't there, that we sort of have a precondition to different types of symptoms and diseases when in fact it really is down to our emotional health and our physical health and our nutritional health. And we must take our health back into our own hands. And that the only place that starts from is really understanding how the soil works and the microbiome, if you like, the microorganism world that live in the soil. Um, yeah, we had uh, Patrick Holden on um, um, a few months back and he was for 20 years a director of the soil association and he was talking about the uh -huh. microbiome actually of the plants as well and and how since herbicides pesticides you know, artificial fertilizers how we've damaged the soil and how that's damaging the microbiome of the plants and therefore uh, I, I like you, what you said about we are what we don't excrete i always say we are what we eat eats so you know if the plants aren't you know absorbing the vitamins the mineral well it's not so much the vitamins but the minerals from the soil then you know we're on that slippy slope. So uh, when we talk about um, the way the plants are grown, does that in itself have a big effect on the microbiome? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I get a question. I get the question a lot. Um, organic is so expensive. Why do you do organic? And the biggest tip I ever give people is to eat organic. And it's you know it's. Health is, health is seen as very elitist, and I totally see that as well, uh, because people are always trying to, you know, the, the health and wellness world has completely catapulted in the last five years, hasn't it? And it's got a bit of an image to it. And I'm really trying to advocate that it doesn't have to be 
an elitist um, way of life. It's just about getting back to getting back um, to, to the basics. Um, and if we and when it comes to organic, it's about choosing not to eat food that, as you say, has been sprayed with fertilizers and pesticides because your body then has to deal with them. It's like another load of information that it has to deal with. So you think about food as being intelligent. It's about what you, what intelligence you're choosing to sort of sponge up into your life. So I'd rather eat a tomato that wasn't sprayed with any kind of chemicals because I understand that my liver is going to have to deal with that. Um, and, and that's really all it comes down to. It's not about um, anything other than counting the chemicals on the plants that have been sprayed for a bigger yield um, rather than really looking at the benefit um, and the amount of vitamins and minerals and um, m you know nutrients that are going into our bodies. So m organic is the easiest way to look after your health in terms of getting the best nutrition um, available to, to, to humans. Yeah, and people, you know, I had that levied at me after I wrote my first book. Oh, that's just, uh, that's just a way of living for posh people. And I, and I had to think about that. Uh, but the more I thought about it, that actually once you transist into eating real foods and get away from the processed foods, maybe the first week or two is a bit more expensive. But after that, when you cut down the snacking, because we don't snack when we're eating properly, you know, eating little but often is so not the right thing to do. So we, end, we then end up only having real meals. So we cut out the crisps, the, the fizzy pops, which are all expensive. We cut out all, all the, the naughty snacks. And then what you find uh, is that you end up then quite often not having three meals a day. Many people like myself become uh, uh, an OMAD, one meal a day. And actually then you go, well, I'm taking less time off work, which even if you get paid sick pay, eventually you don't get the pay rise because you're always sick, sick note Joe. Uh, you don't need all these expensive gym memberships. You don't need all these health magazines because once you understand the basics, uh, so actually while that transition from unhealthy eating to healthy eating it might be an expensive transition, eventually you can go completely organic, completely natural food, and actually, because you're eating less, but you're eating better quality and more nutrition, it actually is cheaper at the end. So I would argue for, for many people that it isn't a posh way of living. It, it primal is can be very inexpensive. And of course, you can then get into growing some of your own uh, you know, fruit and veg at home, which we've all forgot how to do. Absolutely. I think that I think as a society, you know, we we overdo everything. And one of them is certainly eating. We, we, you know, I always say to my clients and friends, leave the grazing to the cows. That's what they're designed to do. But humans are not designed to graze 24-7. Uh, yeah, I say, um, I, I say even stronger than you, you know, grazing is for cows. So if you want to be like a cow, then <laughs> just, that's fine. Yeah. If you want to look like a cow, eat like a cow. But I shouldn't say that, but there you go. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just so wrong, is it? And, and of course, the snack yeah. companies love that slogan, eat little but often, because that's why snacking so, you know, outrageously popular. Yeah. And I think the problem is, is that it's sort of, we're sort of living in this, you know, it's very easy to say everyone's stressed out. But I think stress sort of rears its heads in lots of different ways that, you know, a lot of people don't realise. And, you know, if you've got a broken foot or you're going through a relationship breakup, or you're going through grief or any of those emotions, then that um, infiltrates into the, the stress, the gut brain axis, cortisol levels, sex and stress hormones. Um, and it, and it uh, destabilizes the whole body. And when you've got, when you've got more output, when you're constantly shooting out, you know, you've got bills to pay, you've got problems to deal with, you're running out of all the enzymes, you, enzymes of acids of hormones and essentially then that depletes um you know the microbiome and the the immune system because it's the immune system that lives within the gut you know we've got these we've got these defense systems in our bodies and for, and the first one is is the is the stomach hydrochloric acid which i always think is um one of them the least talked about um the least talked about subjects within gut health you know I, I there's loads of people writing about gut health but there are two things i wanted to talk about that people don't talk about enough and i just don't understand why the, the first is called the cephalic response um and the cephalic response is um 
thinking about what you want to eat, um, smelling that food, tasting that food, thinking about that food and getting the senses stimulated. You see, most of us just run, um, eat on the on the go, in the car, or walking to work, or we don't eat. And the cephalic response, so if you now think about opening a bag of salt and vinegar crisps, or, Got it. When, or when you get home, open a bag of salt and vinegar crisps, and the, and the first thing that happens is that your mouth sort of fills up with saliva. Before you eat, creates, before you even taste the food, yeah. Before you even. So even me just saying to you, think about it, you can feel the saliva coming. And that's the cephalic response. And that is the most important thing about digestion. Um, m most of digestion happens in the mouth. It doesn't happen in the gut. It happens in the mouth. The saliva needs to be stimulated. The enzymes live in the saliva, salivary amylase. And then we need to do a pastime that has almost fallen off the face of the earth, which is chewing. And we need to chew. If we chew our foods, we break it down. It goes down into the esophagus in a much easier form. Um, then it's um, the hydrochloric acid um, gets to the food and cleaves the bonds, turns, you know, turns them into amino acids, peptides, and then it goes into the small intestine. So... If we only chew once, you know, we've all done it. We've chewed, we've chewed once, swallowed, and then gone, oh, ow, yeah. that hurts. Um, but we're doing too much of that. And then we're having to take supplements, and then we're using PPIs because we're depleting all the acid in the stomach by eating too quickly, being too stressed out, and eating the wrong foods. And if you think of the stomach a bit like a swimming pool, you know when you go... I'm, I can't, don't know if you ever have, but if you've been to a public swimming pool, probably not recently, um, but they always ask you to shower before you go in, don't they? They do. They do. They and do. that's sort of, they want, they want to get the, it's sort of saying, can you have a wash? And the, and the acid in the stomach is a bit like a wash as well. We need mm -hmm. to get rid of the pathogens and the antigens before they cross over into the bloodstream and get into the places in the body they don't want to be. So the acid is the most important thing to start again from chewing the, 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 the digestive process. And the problem is there's a lot of people out there with a very low supplies of stomach acid and therefore are um, being given and getting symptoms of uh, acid reflux, for example, and then being given um, acid uh, dampeners to reduce the amount of acid they don't really have and thereby um, depleting their digestive capabilities and reducing the mucin around the stomach for protection and so on and so on. So the cephalic response is fundamental, fundamental. Uh, and and, and, and what, what, are you, what are you suggesting that we do to enhance that? Obviously, uh, we've said eat organic, eat diverse and eat slower, chew your food. Is there other things we can do? Yeah, I mean, you touched on it a little bit ago when we are talking about how food used to be more diverse. Um, we used to, you know, we used to have more bitter foods in our diet. Um, and the bitter foods stimulate enzymatic production as well. Um, things like watercress, rocket, um, cider apple vinegar um you can buy swedish bitters which will stimulate the production of enzymes as well and the this is what needs to happen before we eat or we certainly need to be including these foods into our diets as well that's yeah, really really, that really will, it's really good advice yeah. and is the carb overload part of the problem for people getting their microbiome into a bit of a mess. And the only reason I ask that is, uh, I read an article about uh, the sugar plantations uh, in the Caribbean, that when the sugar right. comes into the plantations, occasionally they have to close it down because a certain bacteria called Firmicutes loves sugar. Therefore, it, if it, by fact it loves sugar, it must love carbs, must love bread, must love all this processed stuff. 
Uh, and Firmicutes is now being associated with you know, putting on excess weight. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so, there, so I do a lot of testing, functional diagnostic testing, and I test the stool. And one of the readings we'll get, we'll have a look at all the bacteria um, within the body. But one of the readings we get are Firmicutes to bacteria, um, bac bacteroidites. And when Firmicutes are um higher then that would in uh, 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 that would assume the person is leaner than if they were lower they would be more obese and that ratio of those two essential uh bacteria um can predict um essentially weight gain in in a person um so to to make sure that your firmicutes stay high as you say you know, some of the things we can be doing are eating this very rich, fibrous food, rich in prebiotics, rich in polyphenols. Polyphenols are literally the food source for bacteria. Um, so your dark, your dark berries, cherries, uh, your dark fruit and vegetables, chocolate, even some really good dark chocolate. Red wine is classed as a polyphenol. Um, these are the foods that then feed the bacteria and keep those ratios out. You'll probably find that, that, that it is the other way around if you've had a history of antibiotic use or if you've had a history of processed food um, or, or just the process of stress. Um, because when we're stressed, we're more likely to eat the sugar, fast, uh, fast release carbs that just give, it that, give us that instant hit. So you can start to see how it's not just about the food we eat. It's about the emotional status we find ourselves in and therefore what that then leads us to do, how to behave, how to sleep, how to eat, how to be. And it, it can seem like a bit of a tricky cycle to get out of, um, but you can see how it suddenly very quickly cascades. Um, and, and I guess it all starts with that, um, with, with the stress cycle. Yeah, and I, and I guess... You know, even though there's tens of thousands of different strains of bacteria, it seems to be these two that dominate in terms of volume inside uh, inside our gut, the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidets. And it's it, 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 we're starting to understand now that these two, if you just get the balance wrong, can make a huge difference to your weight. And some people are even saying that you know, obese, uh, the battle with obesity may be, you know, one of the biggest things you can do is just readdress these two bacteria. In the stomach and haven't they done some tests with identical twins um with these two uh, yeah. uh bacteria yeah there's a fabulous um uh chap called dr tim specter who's written a, a load of books um and he sort of headed the study on the twins uh the twin study at king's college where he took you know um lots and lots of sets of twins to study their microbiome so genetically, they're obviously identi identical twins, um, but he would find that one would have lupus and the other wouldn't, or one would be overweight and the other wasn't. And it all came down to certainly those two bacteria, but obviously the other strains of bacteria in the diet as well. And that comes down to essentially that we're not, you know, you may be identical, but it doesn't mean you're eating identical foods. He sort of then that then went on to the way that certain foods will react with blood to, to affect your blood sugar levels in the in the diet um and he's done a big glucose study about how you know let's say you and i both drink a glass of orange juice the the con conventional um wisdom or advice has always been that you know you don't want to eat a big bowl of pasta um if you're diabetic or you don't want to eat a drink a large glass of orange juice because they'll raise your blood sugar levels but actually, this isn't really true. It's all, again, down to individual bio um, individuality. Um, and he's proved that in his studies as well. So what we thought was the way to deal with high blood sugar, diabetes and, um, and obesity has sort of been turned on its head to a very individual level. And again, comes back to what is in your gut and what intelligence you're feeding yourself. Isn't it amazing that Hippocrates 2,000 years ago said that all illness starts in the gut uh, and, and now we're finding that you know, way more illnesses than we ever realised actually do start in the gut and it's your state of your 
buyer and the, could be making the difference. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, you know, it all just seems, I think a lot of people just think food is food. And it's getting back to that education where not all food is created equally. And um, we really need to drive that home in people. Food is our medicine. There is no other medicine that we can use other than the way that we eat, how we eat, what we choose to eat, who we choose to eat with, um, and the times that we eat. They're all integral to the health of the whole body. You know, in, 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 in the book um, that, I've, that I've written that you talked about, every chapter is an organ and it tells you what the organ does. And if we look at Chinese traditional medicine, which uh, a lot of the emotional information I've drawn on in the book, um, it connects an emotion to each organ, but also a time of day on the, on the circadian rhythms. So, you know, the, the, the stomach, for example, is five to seven, the, the gastro system is sort of five to seven in the morning. That's when elimination happens. The stomach is first thing in the morning a bit later. The liver is in the middle of the night when people typically wake up and go to the loo, detoxification. And so when we connect the whole body together, we get a, obviously a much better picture of how it works. And it's educating people how their body works to know then therefore how to eat, to sort of be able to come back to themselves and say, how am I feeling? What do I want? What works for, for, for you may not work for me. And if I change my diet to your diet, I might very well get sicker. It may mean no difference or I might feel better. But it, it's just driving home this very bio-individuality when it comes to, to humans because we're all, all very different. And a lot of people liken it, don't they? It's exactly picking up what you said there. You know, a lot of people liken it to a rainforest or a coral reef that you know you need it to flourish. And if it's not flourishing, you could just have one strand in there that's missing, that's vital, uh, and and it can lead to all <coughs> sorts of metabolic syndromes and and, and illnesses. Um, can I pick up on something you mentioned a moment ago? Uh, prebiotics yeah. and probiotics. What's the difference between the two? Um. Well, we, you need them both for a commensal sort of environment within the gut. If you think of prebiotic foods, for example, they're like things with inulin, so um, garlic, Jerusalem artichoke, um, leeks, onions. They're all sort of, if you think about probiotics as feed, sorry, prebiotics is almost feeding the probiotics. And then the probiotics then, you know, the ones that we know of, lactobacillus, bifobacter, um they then feed their they then make up the microbiome so, so prebiotic so the, 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 is almost food for probiotics so prebiotics is building the house building the environment the, the right coral yes. reef uh from your onions yeah. your inulin and, and so on and so forth and then the probiotics are putting in the, the you know the good bacteria which comes from our food and also um I, I believe anything that's fermented helps. So like fermented or live yogurts and things like that. Talk us about why, because again, I always remember my grandparents always, you know, pickling everything and everything was always in a jar. Uh, and we just don't do that anymore. So maybe again, that's damaged our microbiome, the fact we don't pickle anything anymore. Yeah, I think you look, I mean, there's loads of countries that are way ahead of us in the fermentation game. You've got, um, uh, the Germans with their sauerkraut, the Koreans with their kimchi, the Japanese of uh, their pickles and miso, um, the Swiss with their milks and um, you know um, par and pasteurized products. They're, they're all the and they all come from a very natural way of living. It's part of their culture, and food is culture. And we're sort of missing out on this culture because we're not cultivating um, as much as we used to. I mean, back in the day, I'm sure my grandma was eating a lot more, as you say, pickled foods. And they became the sort of digestive aid to the meal. And they would, you would have it in a very small supply. And what happened is that those pickled veg or the, the, um, the high digestive uh, fermentation got, got sort of wiped out and ketchup came in and mayonnaise came in. And all these other things sort of became our accompaniments to food, um, which are really, really high in sugar. And now you get people spreading ketchup all over their food. Um, 
and, and but it used to be sauerkraut, it used to be kimchi, it used to be pickled um, courgettes or pickled cabbage and things like that. And so the thing is, for me, we've sort of gone a bit fermentation crazy. Um, and it, like with anything, there's good and a bad side to it. There's, um, you know, a huge influx of SIBO with people at the moment. Very difficult to test for. But that's a fermentation in the small intestines. Um, and we can overeat fermented foods. People overeat sauerkraut. And there's really no need. You know, it's like taking too much of a of a vitamin. Uh, it's not to say you just wee it out and it becomes expensive urine. But, you know, there's only, sci there's only so much scientific research that will say, you know, 80 milligrams of vitamin C is the, the RDA for the day. Do What if I take more? Do I become better? Do I become more efficient? Not really, um, if you're already a healthy person. And that's the same with, with fermented food. You know, there's a load of people out there knocking back kefir and butcher, sauerkraut and kimchi, and they've got gut problems. Right. So you, in terms of fermented foods, you can have too much of a good thing. And it's back to that thing that you said at the very beginning, isn't it? It's, it's just try and be more diverse, but diverse, of course, with yeah. real foods. Diverse with real foods. I mean, it is. It's too. That is the phrase, you know. The t the t too much of a good thing can obviously backfire on you um and i i always think you know to some uh, really good advice i give my clients i say your bet your body is a bit like a baby it needs to start telling you things it needs to start indicating when it's happy and when it's sad and the digestive system is a system that is independently independent you know it it's it likes routine and if you don't live a routine life, then your digestive system is not going to be that routine either. So just like a baby, if a baby cries, it needs three things. And we're not very different. We haven't evolved differently at all. Um, it, it'll cry and it either needs a big poo, um, it needs some love, or it'll be hungry. Yes. And when we've got symptoms as, as adults, the three things are are very they're the only really three things you go to what will make you better um you know a good bowel movement some food or some love um and i don't think it's that much more difficult and we're missing the basics more than ever you know i see constipation nine times out of ten with clients right. and i have to figure out whether that's an emotional constipation or it is indeed a physical, uh, mechanical constipation. Um, I say to some, I say to some people, let's just say that you're really, really good at being constipated, <laughs> you know, and, and and it's true because they can be constipated for, you know, they can go twice a week. So I say, let's just say you're really good at being constipated. Now we have to get really bad at it. We have to completely change the way whether it's your thought process, it's the way you eat, it's what you're doing. Um, and if you look at the gut, which is, um, if you look at the stomach, which is, again, the emotion, the, 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 the organ that holds the emotion of anxiety, um, and, and you look at mental health issues today in the world, um, then you can start to see why how we eat has a direct relationship to what's going on up here the gut and the brain are you know they're best friends and you can't um rule one out you know they're connected by this vagus nerve which sends all the information down um so it's just about so my point is is that it's you know gut health is is, is equally as important as mental health they go time together you can't just change the food you eat you have to look at the whole system yeah. and the whole system of the digestive system starts with the brain starts with chewing, finishes at the anus, and the terrain within that digestive system changes quite a lot as, the, as we go through the different sections of it. And, 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 and your point there is so, so valid and so true that, that you know, depression and anxiety um, yes, can so be linked, can't it, to the food choices. You know, good food equals good mood. And the first thing I talk to people about, I'm, I'm not nowhere near as educated as you on the subject, but I say, look, why do you think the word dessert, spelt backwards, <laughs> is stressed? 
<laughs> so <laughs> it desserts spelled backwards is stress. So desserts stress you, and you know sugar stresses you. And let's let's start. Well, let's let's uh, you know. Okay, you, you're anxious or you, you're sort of in depression. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Let's forget that for a second. Let's have a look at food. Let's see what you're eating, and then see if your mood in, you know, gets any better when we stop. The, the overload of yeah. bread and sugar and fizzy sodas and 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 we replace it with you know healthy broccoli and organic meat and so on and so forth and uh, and for a lot of people it does sort the mood out yeah it does i think you know good digest you know just another point to hit on is, is the way that we're eating and, and maybe we're all eating a bit calm in a more calm environment now um but the biggest thing so i'm i'm very heavy on you know, I say, if you don't chew, then you haven't got a problem. Come back to me when you've started chewing. Um, and the other thing is the environment. You know, flats are made. <laughs> I hate, you know, I'm, I live in London pre-pandemic. Um, but, you know, flats are being sold in London without kitchens. <laughs> like, you know, like they're not important without a dining table. The dining table is the most important part of your of your house. Um, and we're forgetting how to eat. So the phone should be off. The blue light shouldn't be anywhere around you. Um, you shouldn't be listening to any sort of news because it stimulates cortisol and then that diverts away from the digestive system. So the environment that you eat, which, it, you know, maybe people only do it on a Sunday when the family come around and have a, a good old chit chat, but it needs to be every day. Everyone needs to sit at a table. They need to have a bit of water. They need to have created that cephalic response. There needs to be no rush. There needs to be nowhere to go after it uh, because you've set yourself a nice time zone to eat your breakfast in in a relaxed manner and you will have optimal digestion. You don't need to look any further than those simple basics um, if you're not doing that. Yeah, if you're and that... not doing it, do it and then, then have a look. And that was the French paradox, wasn't it, where they went, well, the French... Are living healthy and all the all the metrics, all the measurements, the blur, the glue, everything looks great for the French. And then they went, oh, it's because they drink loads of wine. And, and it wasn't drinking the wine. It was just the way they eat. They eat in that social, nice relaxed, relaxed, yeah. Very, Absolutely. very. Absolutely. We could definitely take the leaf out of their book. I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> can I we know. go? <laughs> it's great. I'm loving it. Can we uh, go and get some questions from the internet? Because we've got loads of people watching that want to yeah, ask sure, you questions. Um, what about sauerkraut and pickled tomatoes, cucumbers, cauliflowers, carrots? Yeah, pickle anything you've got. Um, absolutely. I mean, lots of, you know, in the book, there's lots of different vegetables that are more associated with different organs. Um, you've got all your cruciferous vegetables that help the liver and detoxification. But in terms of pickling, you can pickle anything, um, for sure. Brilliant. Great advice. Uh, Leah says, the gut is so complex. My grandson does not have the enzymes to break down starch in carbs. Uh, has been two years of pain and discomfort for him. Also CMPI. Uh, a relief to be diagnosed. Uh, still issues, but easier. Yeah, I mean, I guess that I probably need to have a bit more information. But I mean, I guess the idea is then making sure the diet is really diverse, probably adding in some very good digestive enzymes. There are digestive enzymes and then there are enzymes and pancreatic enzymes with ox bile and things like that. And there are um, proteolytic enzymes. So it's important to get the right um, mix that's just a little bit more of investigation but obviously if you drop me an email i'll be able to sort of give you some um, more individual advice about that no problem thank you for that leah uh, an offer there from hannah to drop her an email which we've got hannah's uh, website up on our screen right now uh, there is also a hotel built without windows <laughs> just a small room uh, i was surprised that was approved in london yeah it's just getting crazy out there uh, do so Samuel says, do gut problems cause stress or does stress cause gut problems? <laughs> yeah, very good question. I guess um, 
I guess if you if you if you come from the point of view that when we're babies, everything everything cellularly knows essentially how to behave perfectly, and it's only with environmental in, in, in uh, influence that things start to change. Cells go rogue. So it's about looking at the environment and asking when did things start going rogue? When did things start becoming unbalanced? And what escalates that? And stress for sure is going to be that the different the difference between stress and sex hormones, the decline or rise of cortisol and progesterone, and then how that affects it's a knock on effect. I think we have to remember that, you know, certainly in terms of uh, the digestive system, it, the digestive system can seem to always take a back seat to a lot of other systems in the body. The main aim for the body and for us is to stay alive. And it will do anything to fight that. So um, if you are stressed, then your body's only interested in, in getting you through the day and getting those vital things working. And the digestive system takes a bit of a back seat. Um, so if you are feeling stressed, then it, it, changing your diet, obviously, if it's best, but more than anything, it's about um, getting adequate rest, good sleep and looking at your circadian rhythm. So making sure from 6 p.m. You're, 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 you're switching off. Everything is switched off. Create the sleep system and then everything should pick up. That's great, great advice. And so few people uh, you know, work their life around the circadian sort of rhythm of the body. And it's so, so underrated. Um, uh, uh, first year I ever have put no potatoes in. Ah, that's good. Uh, oh, hang on. I've jumped halfway down a conversation here. Uh, I love my allotment. <laughs> I wonder what that meant then. Um, I love my allotment as I know what has happened to the food I grow. I think there will be a growth of people wanting to grow their own. And then she says it's the first year I haven't put potatoes in. Good on you, Beatrice. You know, I want the allotment to come back. I, 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 I've <laughs> I think the government should pay us to have allotments, not the other way around. It's so, Absolutely. so... Absolutely. Yeah, so important. I mean, there are waiting lists, aren't there? There are waiting lists for people to get allotments. We need to be clearing more wasteland and more, you know, to, to, to people to, to, to get onto allotments. I couldn't agree more. Well done. Yeah, totally, totally with you there. I, I mean, we're facing, a, I think, the first generation now, my children's generation, that probably even forget that food grows. You know what I mean? It's just available in the supermarket, you know. Uh, it, it's just, we've just got to get back to some basics, haven't we, to get the, the, the health of, of our guts working properly. Get back to basics, real food. Um, I remember we were eating roasted beef uh, of pork or lamb with pickled veg, of course, uh, so Marva said, yeah, she remembers those times of uh, the, the pickled foods. Um, now, I've got one final, final, final question for you, and that is, uh, how do people get in touch with you? Obviously, they can buy your book, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, how do they get in touch with you uh, if they feel that they may, may need some help getting their gut back in working order? Sure. So I guess the best place is to go to my website. I offer a 15 minute, you know, chat on the phone to see whether I can help and I'm the right person for you. Um, so I, you know, definitely, or if you definitely just want to go ahead and do some work, then just drop me an email. Um, I'm on Instagram as the gut clinic. I'm quite vocal on there uh, and post about conditions and a lot of gut health stuff. So I guess really just hit, hit my website and pop me an email and I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Hannah, we could go on all day talking about this, my favourite subject. Can we get you back on at some stage? I would love to. I love talking about it too. Excellent, excellent. And uh, when this lockdown is all finished, let's go and have a nice, healthy, low-carb meal together in London on me because you've been an absolutely fabulous, fabulous guest. Thank you for coming on. Oh, pleasure. Thank you so much and um, great work you guys are doing and uh, Enjoy the rest of this wonderful time that we're never going to get back. Well, it's yeah, that's the thing is we've got to, we've got to look for the positives. We've got to look for exactly. the positives. And because uh, if not, we'll all be stressed. Cortisol will go up. Our gut will get even more damaged and it'll be a downward spiral. So if we can at least try, and that's the whole idea of this show really, is to try and give people 
a bit more education and background of you know the food that we eat and how we eat it. Some great advice from you today, um, because we, we need to come out of this in a better place, not a worse place. Yeah, a stronger place emotionally and, and, and physically, for sure. Absolutely. Hannah, thank you very, very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And we'll see you soon. Pleasure. See you soon. Bye-bye. That was the fantastic, lovely and very, very well-informed Hannah Richards. I hope you really enjoyed that. I certainly did. Learned loads about the microbiome uh, uh, then. Uh, thank you very, very much to Hannah. And we will try and get her back on the show on another day. Now, I'd like to go... Uh, Back to London again, uh, but we're going to speak to Kate Dangerfield. Kate is the operations manager of the London and the South East uh, for the Trussell Trust. Can you hear me? I can't hear Kate yet, Jack. No, can you? Uh, not Say hello to everybody this morning, Jack. You've not. You've been shy this morning. Oh, There's my son Jack, who should be at university right now, but of course, like all places of learning, are closed yeah. down, and he's. Missing his friends and missing his girlfriend. I thought I'd get that in because she's probably watching right now. And uh, But he's learning a lot about producing TV shows. And he's going to try and get Hi. Kate uh, back on the line. While we wait for Kate, let's um, just remind well, you. I'll tell you what, I've just seen someone pop in the chat. She's going to arrive. And I believe she has sent in the wonderful Quite Pancake. Ah, oh, OK. Uh, Gemma uh, Irvine, who's uh, on the chat right now. Uh, sent in uh, this pancakes, which is all being made with healthy, low to no carbs with some great berries on the top. And berries, of course, we call them the Fab Four, the strawberry, the raspberry, the blueberry, the blackberry. They are super, super healthy foods. Uh, and while they do have sugar, their sugar is different to the fructose that we find uh, in other uh, fruits. Uh, and therefore, we totally recommend that you go and get loads and loads of berries but do always try and get organic it doesn't matter whether they're frozen or fresh in fact sometimes frozen is, e- frozen is even better because they're normally frozen right after picking uh, frozen or fresh doesn't matter but it does need to be organic for example a blueberry that's organic against a blueberry that's not organic has up to nine times more antioxidants uh, in the skin of an organic berry than one that has been grown hydroponically. Uh, in other words, not in soil at all. Uh, Kate, good morning, how are you? Good morning, I'm really well, thank you. Great. Thank you for having me on. No, it's, it's absolutely our pleasure. Tell us uh, sort of a bit of an update if you can. How's, how's it going at the food banks? Yeah, things are going pretty well. Uh, It's a very busy time, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, across London. Um, So I specifically support uh, food banks across London who are doing a remarkable job responding to the increased need that they're seeing um, and converting to home deliveries and operating their centres in new ways that are keeping people safe. So they're doing a great job providing food to people who are in financial crisis. Um, But the demand is high. Um, But yeah, they're doing a fantastic job and are being very resilient this crisis any uh, particular foods that you're struggling to get hold of i know last time we spoke uht milk was was something you were desperately trying to get hold of uh is there any particular shortage of certain foods that we should be prioritizing as we put uh, in, into those collection boxes Yeah, definitely. There are always a few items that we um, tend to run short of. So the key thing still are UHT milk. Um, Also tinned fish and tinned meat and tinned fruit are often in short supply. Um, Another one would be tinned puddings um, or long life puddings. Those are really helpful and tend to be the things that food banks are running short of. So if people want to donate to their um, local food bank, the best way to do it um, is to go onto the Trussell Trust website. You just pop in your postcode and it tells you which one is your local food bank and how to donate it will probably be the suggestion will be go to your local supermarket and pop it in um, the collection box which will be near the till but your local food bank website will tell you the best place to donate so thank you to those who have donated already it makes a huge difference yeah i was uh, in my local supermarket the other day and uh, about two weeks ago the, 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 in the collection box nothing uh, and I went the other day right. and lots more things uh, start to go in. So and, and again, that's an, a- anecdotal of just one uh, supermarket. But uh, it's so and so important, isn't it? And, and quite and people don't. This what I didn't realise is you don't have to buy it in that supermarket. They don't even mind, you know, because they might be out of UHT milk and you might have UHT milk that's in, been in your cupboard as, you know, for, for six months. And as long as it's in date, you can take that and put that in, in, in the food banks. 
Absolutely. As long as it's in date um, and food that has a long shelf life. And um, so the things on that you just saw on your screen are the key things that food banks are looking for. Um, and those donations make such a difference. So when you donate in your local community, it goes to your local food bank and serves local people in crisis. So it really does make a huge difference. So thank you to everyone who has donated in that way. And it is all about supporting uh, the community, isn't it, at the moment? In fact, I've got to tell a lovely little story about my little Lily. She's 12 years old. And of course, I have to be careful what I say here because I'm going to get a lot of backlash because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally, totally, I don't eat bread, pasta, rice myself, but I can't prevent my kids from occasionally doing it. Anyway, the other day, she baked some lovely little cakes. And I said, what are you doing? We've got five kids in the house. There's way too oh, They're not first, Daddy. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm taking them round. Uh, there's a, a street in front of us, predominantly uh, older people. She said, I'm, I'm taking it and giving it to everybody. And oh, she, she, dropped, she dropped cakes off at all these homes. Uh, and in the last week, we've had five letters drop through the door to say thank you to her. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the, the positives of, I think, the lockdown is I think we're going to come out with stronger communities. You know, I'll be absolutely honest. I did not know how many people were going without food in our country until I spoke to your CEO, Emma, just, you know, just as we began the lockdown and we, we came up with this idea of the show and trying to help raise money for you. I, I just wasn't aware. But I think coming out the back end, we're going to be a much more conscientious society. And, and, and I think we'll be stronger together for it. Absolutely. It, it, and we've seen a huge um, amount of uh, kind of amazing responses from communities wanting to come together to support people in this crisis, which is uh, fantastic. And the food banks wouldn't have been able to respond in the way they have without that community spirit. I mean, for us, our vision is to see an end to the need for food banks. Um, and food banks are looking forward to working with all those people in their communities who have um, become more aware um, of poverty in the UK and become more aware of the scale of the need for food banks. And our food banks are really passionate about taking that message helping people understand the scale of the need and then working towards a solution where we actually don't need food banks anymore um, because everyone has enough uh, money in their pocket to be able to buy food for their family and um, that's the aim uh, that's the vision uh, and food banks are looking forward to working with all these new people in their community who have come forward um, in the months uh, and years to come to work towards that solution so yeah, I'm, I'm sure that your community centers rather than you know, handing those food parcels out would because I know you run by volunteers and I know it's a bit different in lockdown because you can't do that social interaction that you have been doing. Yeah. But I bet your volunteers would much rather people come into the community centres just for a chat and a coffee and a cup of tea, knowing that we've got society more balanced, more equal, that everybody has got food on the table for themselves and their children. Absolutely. That's exactly what we're working towards, a situation where we have a benefit system that fully supports people who are in crisis and every family is able to have enough money uh, to be able to provide for their family. So we're doing all sorts of work at Trussell Trust campaigning to see the changes that will kind of anchor people from poverty and prevent them um, being swept into a situation where they find themselves needing a food bank. So the money that people are donating uh, via Primal Living on your uh, Just Giving channels is enabling us to do exactly that to move forward and look for these solutions that will actually help create a society where this is no longer needed but also really practically now the money people are, are donating is enabling us to provide funding to food banks support guidance to help them in very practical ways respond to the crisis that's happening right now and then longer term look at what are the solutions and how can we actually move towards ending this need? So it's absolutely fantastic uh, that you're supporting us in this way. And we are hugely grateful to you and to everyone who's donated so far. I think over £18,600 has been donated so far. So thank you to your viewers. Oh, no, you're more than welcome. And we're doing everything we can to try and make that number go up and up and up for you. And I'll, I'm going to request everybody that's watching right now one more thing. On Thursday, when we go outside at 8 o'clock and clap for our brilliant... NHS uh, uh, staff, the nurses, the doctors, the key workers and all those that are working so hard in the uh, care home. I'd ask everybody just to have a little thought as well and a little extra round of applause for those that are operating and working uh, in the food banks because w without you, uh, the country would be, well, lots of people would be going uh, without a meal this evening. Uh, Kate, thanks for dialing in. It's been an absolute pleasure no seeing problem. you. And uh, well, we're going to see you again, I think. So I think this lockdown's carrying on for a bit longer than we anticipated. So maybe we'll, we'll chat again next week. 
Brilliant. Thank you for having me on and love to come back uh, sometime. Thank you. L lovely. Thank you, Kate. That was Kate Dangerfield from the Trussell Trust. They operate 1,250 food banks across the UK and they really, really need us to make some small donations, larger, of course, if you can, uh, because we have to make sure that in this difficult time, everybody in our country has got access to food. Thank you for your time today. Thank you to the brilliant Hannah Richards. Uh, until the same time tomorrow, uh, keep safe. And if you can, give it the thumbs up. That would be great. Uh, if you can uh, set this, uh, uh, maybe the little bell, the little reminder, that would be great. Uh, if you could subscribe, then you'll never miss out on any of our uh, new videos. We put uh, cooking ideas up uh, once or twice uh, every week. Well, uh, that's uh, uh, done by our team at Primal Living that uh, help work on our new recipe book that we're working on, Primal Gourmet 2. Um, so yeah, do subscribe and then you'll never, ever, ever be without some food inspiration. And also go and have a look at Primal Living if you can on Instagram, have a look at us on Facebook, and of course, take part in our competitions. Till tomorrow, God bless. We'll see you again at the same time. Join me at 10 o'clock every morning live on YouTube. Simply go to Primal Living's channel and you'll see our new Food Bank Show. Now the Food Bank Show is basically what it says on the tin. We're trying to raise money for food banks across the UK that more than ever need our support. At the same time, in every show, I'll be joined by doctors and nutritionists that are going to help us reshape the food that we eat. Because maybe there's a bit of a silver lining for our health right now. All of the restaurants are shut. The McDonald's, the Subway, the Greggs, they're all closed. So we've got to change our eating habits anyway. But with the advice of the world's leading doctors and the world's leading nutritionists, I'm going to help you reshape the food that you're consuming and hopefully boost your immune system to get through this very difficult time.